So there's this huge public park in the south end of the city I live in. And every summer when we're kids, me and my friends would spend our days lounging around the swing sets or chilling by the duck pond. As we got into our teens and our group of friends snowballed into a much larger one which included girls, we kept the same tradition, all meeting up on the park to share pilfered booze and cigarettes when we got a little too big for the swing sets. So this whole thing takes place after a long day in the sun, as we're all going our separate ways. I was part of one larger group that was headed roughly south, towards the main gates of the park that would put us back on the road. I'm talking maybe about five or six of us, all half drunk and acting dumb, all walking in one direction, when we hear one of those smaller motocross engines in the distance behind us. I've never even remotely been a gearhead, so I'm not about to tell you exactly how many cc's this thing had or the make and model. Just know we heard this thing in the distance and, at first, didn't really think anything of it. We're still walking pretty slow and the engine is getting louder and louder, so we're kind of following the sound for a minute or two before this motocross bike thing comes into view. The driver, face obscured by his helmet, stops dead when he sees us, his head jerking so the black visor is pointed directly at us. Now, ragging a motocross bike around a public park like this is super illegal here in the UK, or if it's not legal, it's certainly not something the police would be comfortable with you doing. So I've no doubt that, for a moment, the driver sort of panicked when he saw us. But I mean, we were just these skanky-looking teens, so short of witnessing a murder, we're not the kind of people to get right on the phone to the police. I remember one of us even waved to the dude and shouted, Nice bike! but apparently the friendly gesture didn't do us any favors. The biker revs his engine and begins speeding over to us, covering the 200 or so meters in a matter of seconds. It was kind of intimidating, but more impressive than anything. I figured he'd come over to show off his hardware and make some friends or something. But I was wrong. He stops the bike just in front of us, his face still obscured by the helmet, while the small engine steadily ticks over. There's a moment of confusion while my friend raises his voice and repeats nice bike at the guy, louder and more pronounced so he can hear us over the engine and through his helmet. The biker doesn't reply. He barely even moves, just keeps staring at my buddy who paid him the compliment. It was about then we realized the biker's intentions were far from good. He dry revs his engine a few times, like the way a bull might rake its hoof in the dirt before a charge. Some of us turned to run, but it was no good. As you can imagine, trying to outrun a motocross bike is about as futile as it sounds. But it was his target of choice that horrified me the most initially. He had his pick of about four or five dudes, but he aimed for the one girl that happened to be with us. He speeds forward and slams the bike into the back of her. She just tumbles into the dirt hard, stunned by the impact. The biker then forces his wheels over her bare legs and revs the engine. The girl screamed in pain, but before we had a chance to react and try to help her, the guy turns his bike towards us and begins to try to take another one of us down. It was absolutely terrifying, trying to dodge getting run over while also trying to get the girl up and moving again so we could escape. I thought the biker might have broken a bone in the girl's leg, but... Somehow he hadn't, and she could still walk despite having the most disgusting, painful-looking friction burns on the back of her leg. I suppose she was just running on pure adrenaline like the rest of us. An opening for a clean escape was found when the biker gunned it at one of us, only to almost hit a tree when the guy dodged his ramming attempt. The guy turns to stop sharply and falls off his own bike, giving us a few seconds to get the girl up and run to the nearest exit large stone wall we'd have to scale to get free. Just as we're about to reach the wall, I hear the engine rev loudly again before one of our buddies screams out loud. I turn to see him on the grass, having been knocked down by the bike and he's holding his wrist as if he's been hurt from the impact or fall. The biker begins to circle us again, readying to charge at us once again. The rest is kind of a blur. I remember helping drag the guy up the wall by his good arm, watching the bike speed towards us again as the rest of us piled over the wall and into the safety of the street on the other side. But we still weren't safe. It'd take 
like 60 seconds for the biker to find the nearest exit and gun it onto the road we were on, so we had to keep running for a little while until we were satisfied we were at a properly safe distance. The girl, who I don't want to name, cried all the way home, mainly from the painful friction burns the back of her legs had received, but also from the shock of just being attacked like that. It makes me angry just typing this, remembering how scared we were at the time and how just a little courage would have seen us through the whole thing. Well, maybe if we stood up to the guy, he'd have just left us alone instead of running like cowards, which is exactly what we did. But part of me is grateful that we didn't. I know that sounds crazy, but just hear me out. Since we were basically the goth kids, which was just dumb now that I look at it, anyone who didn't wear a tracksuit was considered a goth. We got a lot of bull from local tough guys, and this caused a great deal of fear and resentment to build up collectively inside of us. Part of me thinks that if we really did pour out all our hate and discontent onto that guy once he'd fallen off his bike, I might only now be getting out of prison to tell you about it. I get that this makes me sound like a phony tough guy. No one likes people who say could've, would've, should've, but sometimes I think of how easy it would've been just to pile onto the guy and end him properly. His helmet protected his head, sure, but I still remember to this day how exposed the guy's neck was, and without being able to see his face, without the eyes to provide that little hint of humanity, it would have been so easy to crush his windpipe right there on the grass. I think that's what scares me the most, how grown-up me thinks about that time in my life, and how I still can't quite tell myself that it wouldn't have felt good to exact my revenge upon him. Back when I was a teenager, myself and my little group of friends used to hang around down by the river that runs through our town. We had ourselves a quiet little spot overlooking a particularly wide stretch of the river. The views were amazing, especially at sundown and at night. We could look out over the river at the pink and orange sky as the sun set, then gaze up at the stars for hours, all while doing stuff that we weren't necessarily supposed to be doing. So, one night, we were all headed back home pretty late, wandering along little roads and side streets at a nice, leisurely pace. We'd been smoking and drinking, so we're dicking around a little, singing and having play fights and whatnot. But when we see a car's headlights cut through the darkness just a few hundred meters away, we shut up and freeze. We really didn't want to be stopped and searched by the police, so when we realized it wasn't a police car, we all start to relax and continue on our way. We also just expected the car to pass us and head on to wherever it was going. Only it didn't. It crept around a street corner and stopped, engine still running with the headlights aimed at us, almost as if the driver is expecting us for some reason. We thought nothing of it. It's not like we'd done anything to offend anyone. Only someone truly paranoid would have felt any imminent danger at that point. At this point... We head around a corner into a dead-end street. Well, it wasn't quite dead-end. There was a small footpath, a little more than an alleyway, that we regularly used on our route to and from the river. It's about 200 meters in length, and we're still at our slow, leisurely pace as we begin to walk down it. We had barely turned the corner when we were once again bathed in the car's headlights. Just from the shape of the vehicle, we could tell it was the same one from before. And only then did we start to get a little suspicious. I'll never forget that moment the revelry stopped and the feelings of fear began to settle over us. Something was obviously wrong as the driver stopped and watched us for a few seconds. It was obvious now that he was following us, but why, we had no idea. Then, the car began like dry revving its engine gunning it so the car seemed more like an angry monster with glowing white eyes than just some simple form of transportation. We were already kind of jogging away from it at that point, but when it began to tear down the open street towards us, we all broke into sprints and began hurtling away from the speeding car. I remember thinking really clearly at that time how the road was too long and the car too fast for us to actually get away. It was a horrible feeling, and in retrospect, I'm reminded of the old saying about being chased by a bear. 
You don't have to outrun the bear, just your slowest friend. There was a sickening crash of metal on metal, a scream from behind me. I looked back for a moment to see the car reversing from having collided with a parked car. The driver had tried to hit a friend of mine, trying to pin him between the bonnet of his car and the chassis of another. If he'd been successful, he'd have crushed my friend's legs, and there'd have been a decent chance he'd either be run over totally or bled to death from the catastrophic fractures right there in the street. Now, by this point, we're only about halfway down the street, halfway to the alley, and therefore safety. The car reverses from having smashed into the stationary vehicle, adjusts its heading a little, then begins to zoom down the street towards us once again. I remember hearing someone screaming, and I honestly couldn't tell at the time who it was, but I know now it was the driver barking out of the car's open window at us. For the second time, he tried to smash the front end of his vehicle into us. Only this time, we're not on the road. We're on the pavement to his left, trying to use parked cars as cover. But as we found ourselves without cover for a few moments, the driver picked his moment and swerved to smash into us. I was near the head of the line by that point, so again, I didn't see exactly what happened. But later, I found out that once again, he was just inches away from plowing into my buddies and seriously injuring them. The guy's car is pretty screwed up at this point. We all remember the cranking, grinding engine sounds as he tried to reverse and take another run at us. But it was too late. We reached the end of the street and careened into the alleyway that afforded us protection. But it didn't stop there. We heard the same screaming echoing down the alley towards us as he hopped out of his car and began to chase us on foot. We ran and ran and ran, farther and faster than any of us had before, ever. It was so rough that when we finally found somewhere to hide out, one of the bigger guys puked up all the beer and chips we'd been gorging on that evening. It was absolutely disgusting. Sweating, cursing, barely able to breathe from having run so fast. But in the end, we did actually get away. But that didn't mean we weren't half goddamn traumatized by what we had experienced. And for a good few days, we stayed well away from our little river spot and the roads we'd almost lost our lives on. At least until a few rumors made their way along the grapevine to us. So, to this day, I'm not 100% sure how true any of this stuff is, but I figure I should include it for detail's sake. The day after... None of us had any idea what the car's number plate was. We tossed around the idea of going to the police, but it wasn't like we could be honest with them concerning what we were doing. Call it teenage paranoia, but we decided against any kind of legal recourse. The driver who had tried to kill us ended up arrested for the criminal damage he had caused to the other cars. When we heard this, we knew it was the same guy who had chased us that night. But when more details emerged on who exactly this dude was, I think I pitied the guy more than anything. Apparently, he was a poor mechanic who relied on quick fixes of local cars for his living. In the weeks preceding the chase, he'd been targeted by car thieves, who apparently took to vandalizing his vehicles once they saw how relatively worthless they were. They had made this guy's life a living hell, night after night, for months. The guy had mistaken the car thieves for us. I was still angry about the whole thing, sure, but it wasn't directed at the guy anymore. It was directed to the callous assholes that had driven this guy to near insanity, to the point we'd almost lost our lives as an indirect result. Remember when you were a teenager and one of your friend's parents went away for the weekend? The excitement was palpable, right? In fact, I'm pretty sure when teenagers hear their parents say, weekend away, a series of events are set in motion that will inevitably end with their family home being trashed by drunken pubescence. So back when I was 19, word came down that a friend of a friend was having a house party on a Friday night. Now this was past the point where the first few house parties had ended with various kids being grounded for life and all that, so the emphasis was making sure word didn't spread too far so the party wasn't crashed by strangers, psychos, and strange psychos. Some way, somehow, news of the party was kept to a minimum, 
and when myself and a few mates arrived at the house late on Friday evening, it was actually kind of chill. So for a few solid hours, we chatted, drank, smoked, and showcased music to each other through the auxiliary cable hooked up to a small but powerful iPod dock. A few hours later, I'm getting pretty tired, feeling worse for the wear after a few cans of cider, so I decided to call it a night early. I say early, it's about midnight at that point, and my mates aren't nearly ready to stop drinking, so I head home alone. It's a short, quiet walk, and I climb into bed pretty much the moment I get home. A few hours later, I honestly couldn't tell you what time, I got a phone call. I roll out of bed, annoyed at whoever has decided to call at such an ungodly hour. Caller ID says it's my friend Tom, who had also been at the house party. When I pick up and ask him what he wants, he tells me that Mike is dead. Mike is a mutual friend who'd been at the party too. I can hear people muttering in the background, almost like they're trying to keep their voices down. So my first thought is that it's a prank of some kind, and a bad one at that. I remember telling him pretty clearly that I didn't think that was funny in the slightest before promptly hanging up on him. I got back into bed and fell back asleep. Since I had arrived home late pretty drunk and also had my sleep interrupted by that tasteless prank call, I slept in way, way late. I remember waking up briefly around 10am, checking my phone and finding no missed calls or texts. That was what reassured me that it had indeed been an attempt at a crappy prank. If he was for real, surely Tom would have called or text again. But he didn't, so yeah, I thought nothing of it. That was until I was woken back up by a knock on my bedroom door. It was my mom with the kind of serious look on my face that I rarely saw, if ever. Get downstairs right now, she hissed. When I asked why, she looked straight up angry. Get out of bed right now, put some bloody clothes on and go downstairs. I had no idea why I would be in trouble with her, so I was in an awful mood by the time I put some pants on and wandered downstairs into our family's TV room. In there, sitting on the couch, were two men, dressed very smartly in suits and ties. That's about the time that Tom's phone call flashed in my mind. There was no way these two could be connected, but as soon as they spoke, I knew what was happening. Good morning. We're from Merseyside Police. Your mom said it would be alright if we had a word with you. I was 19, a legal adult. They knew well that they could just take me down to the station if they wanted to, but they didn't. They were being way too nice, almost as if though they were here to give me some very bad news. Mike is dead, isn't he? I remember asking. When one of them nodded their head, I felt awful. One of my best friends in the world had tried to tell me something world-shattering, and I basically just called him a liar. The police guys asked me a load of questions, basically none of which I had the answers to since I'd left the party early. When they were done, they thanked me and left before I immediately got on the phone to Tom to apologize and get the full story. What haunts me to this day is that the whole thing had gone down just a matter of minutes after I'd left. According to him, Tom had said his goodbyes to me, closed the front door to the house, then headed into the kitchen to get another one of his beers out of the fridge. He said he noticed some kind of argument going down around the kitchen table, with a few guys and girls heatedly exchanging opinions, but he didn't think too much of it. What's a little debate between friends, they thought. But this was the start of an argument that would end in death. Mike, the guy in question, had apparently been flirting with a girl he'd known for a while, However, this girl happened to have a boyfriend. Mike apparently didn't know this at the time and was defending a little harmless flirting while the girls were telling him how wrong he was to have such a casual attitude about it. Whatever happened, the girl he'd been flirting with had actually called up her boyfriend who lived just a few streets away to tell him about it. Now I hasten to add that she was in no danger at all. Mike wasn't a creep or a perv by any stretch of the imagination Soon the only reason she'd opted to call her boyfriend was to cause drama. Apparently the boyfriend was a bit of a psycho anyway, 
and the girl called him knowing well he'd overreact and try to start a fight or something. Only he didn't choose to start anything at all. He chose to end something that night. Mike's life. It was actually Mike that answered the door when the boyfriend arrived, and all it took was a simple little, Are you Mike? For the boyfriend to realize that this was the guy he was looking for. But instead of shouting at him, shoving him, or even throwing a punch his way, the boyfriend took out a butcher's knife and plunged it into Mike's chest. The way Tom tells it is absolutely harrowing. Mike had run through the house, running on pure fear and adrenaline, with blood practically pumping out of a hole in his chest. The adrenaline was enough for him to actually scale the brick wall at the back of the house before he collapsed and died in an alleyway, surrounded by his terrified friends. This was all right about the time I was walking home on a quiet March night, feeling at peace with the world. I thought it was just another quiet spring night, but I was walking away from a murder scene. I was all chill, getting into bed, thinking everything was right with the world, and my friend was bleeding to death in a freezing alley. And that's something I don't think I'll ever get over. I grew up in Liverpool during the 1980s. For those of you that don't know, Liverpool's rough reputation was well earned back in those days. Some areas of the city were simply no-go areas for police, and if by chance they ever did come around, it was to kick someone's door off the hinges before lashing them in the back of a van. We've had race riots, our own miniature crack cocaine epidemic, full-on gunfights between street gangs in broad daylight, even threats of Irish terrorism. It was one heck of a time to be alive, but generally, me and my little crew of friends kept our heads down and avoided trouble. That wasn't until one particular day when trouble found us instead. Every summer, on a large piece of parkland not far from where I was living, the local community threw a big summer fair, much like the big state fairs that go on in the U.S., there was fairground rides, candy floss, hot dog stands, little novelty stalls like Guess My Weight, the works. And in a city that was so hideously underfunded by regional and national governments, entertainment was pretty hard to come by. So these fair things were extremely popular with bored locals, including me and my mates. So we wandered down Smithton Road towards this massive open green space that's been pretty much taken over by the traveling fair. Like I said, these things were really popular, so I'm not exaggerating when I say there were literally thousands of people milling around, drinking and soaking up the rare British sunshine. At one point, we find ourselves at one of those stalls with fixed air rifles you can use to shoot small paper targets. Back then, and sort of now too, you had these rough, council estate types who wore only athletic gear namely brightly colored track suits, or as we called them, shell suits. We called them scalies, but any word like similar to thug would fit just as well. Anyway, as one of my mates steps up to do some shooting, so does one of these scaly types, intent on asserting his masculinity over the whole thing. Only, it turns out he's an awful shot and can barely hit the target, while my mate had already had a fair bit of practice as an army cadet, so he pretty much wipes the floor with his scaly lad. As you can imagine, the thuggish shell suit wearer doesn't take this very well at all. As we're getting ready to move on, the scaly lad gets in my mate's face and starts being aggressive with him. My mate just laughs and waves him away, still buzzing from having trashed him at shooting pellets. I didn't catch what was said, but I figured when we walked away the whole thing was over. How wrong I was. About an hour or so later, the four of us are lounging around in the grass not too far from the throngs of people. We've been out and about all afternoon and the baking heat, so we're pretty zonked by that point. All that booze we managed to sneak out of our parents' respective stashes didn't help either, so let's just say our senses and perceptions are much slower than they normally would be. I remember how the mood changed dramatically in a matter of moments. One moment we're sitting there, the next were noticing a large crowd of people making their way through the fairground, at least 100 strong. 
We observe with a kind of amused curiosity for a moment, wondering just why such a large crowd has sprung up, seemingly out of nowhere. Then we realized, as the crowd kind of shifts its movement, that the crowd of people, no, the gang of people, is headed towards us, with the scaly lad at the head of the pack. It was truly grim. One moment we're all chill, the next we're getting ready to run for our lives. Only we can't run, we've managed to box ourselves into a corner of the parkland that's sealed off by big iron fencing. We're trapped. The scaly lad walks right up to my mate, who he'd had the little confrontation with, and shoves him to the ground. My mate, who wasn't scared of a fight, but wasn't one to initiate one, immediately tries to spring back up to his feet, but the scaly lad aims a kick squarely at his face as he tries doing so. My mate falls back, blood leaking from between his lips, completely knocked out from the sickening force of the kick. As horrible as all that sounds, it pales in comparison with the roar of approval it got from the scaly lad's accompanying gang. They were loving every second of it, and since the fight seemed to be over so quickly, they weren't about to just walk away from their horrific entertainment. The three of us who weren't unconscious were just frozen on the spot. I don't think I'd ever been so objectively terrified in my entire life. But then the scaly lad started kicking our down friend around his head, at one point even trying to stomp on his throat. He was actually trying to end his life. And if it wasn't for the unfathomable kindness of strangers, I think he might have actually done it too. Once it was obvious what was happening, the three of us just reacted. I remember trying to shield our knocked out mate's body, taking a few punches from the gang as I did so, while another mate of ours just full on rugby tackled the scaly lad to the ground and began laying into him. I don't think he landed a single punch, he was just bloody flailing his limbs about, screaming in rage as the fear was overcome by pure adrenaline. It wasn't long before we were all on the ground, shielding our heads from the flurries of punches and kicks that came from a group of people that were now little more than animals. But then, somehow, the kicks and punches began to stop. I looked up through one swollen eye to see a group of grown men and women barging their way into this insane cacophony of violence, throwing people to the side and screaming for them to stop. They were soon joined by two patrolling policemen who'd seen the activity and run over to break it up. It didn't really end there, though. Our mate, who'd taken the kick to the mouth, was still unconscious and nothing the police did could wake him up. We honestly thought that he was going to die. One of us dropped to their knees and begged him to wake up, saying he'd do anything, just please wake up. I remember his voice cracking as he spoke, and I thought of her mate's mum. How'd she react when she found out her boy had been kicked to death at a bloody fair? We didn't get any news until the next morning. When we found out, he'd woken up with very little memory of what happened. He was okay in the end, but for a few weeks he just wasn't himself. He seemed overly clumsy and became incredibly shy, in stark contrast to the confident fellow he was beforehand. The scally lad ended up doing just less than a year in prison, having his sentence reduced dramatically because he'd had a difficult upbringing. Nonsense, if you ask me. Now, a little footnote to end this with. In the early 90s, when we were all grown up with full-time jobs and kids in some instances, I met up with one of the guys who was there that day for a pint or two at a local pub, the Willowbank if anyone knows it. As it turned out, the scally who went to prison had developed an addiction while he was inside, and whether it was through sharing needles or something else, he ended up coming positive for a certain disease and died alone in a hospice over in Manchester. I think the scariest thing of all is how, when I heard that news, I just took a swig of my pint and found myself smiling. Back when I was much younger, my friends and I were into urban exploring before it was even really a thing. We grew up in a pretty rough area, with a lot of old apartment buildings that had to be abandoned and eventually demolished due to asbestos. That stuff made them basically fireproof, but where fire and smoke will kill you quick, asbestos will kill you slow. 
but try explaining that to a bunch of teenagers actively looking for somewhere to hide from grown-ups so they can do some distinctly grown-up things. Where other people saw a decrepit, dusty dump, we saw our own little corner of paradise. A home away from home, or maybe home is too strong of a word, but you get the idea. Anyway, there was one particular estate that was almost completely bereft of inhabitants, having been gradually relocated by the city council until there must have been no more than two or three families left over. It was like an actual ghost town. Even the local corner shop had its shutters permanently down with a for sale sign quickly following its indefinite closure. But like I said, that kind of place was our bread and butter. So when they moved out, we moved in. There was this one set of high-rise flats, that's apartments to you North Americans reading, that we used to visit on the regular. The heating and other utilities had been switched off for a while, and this was in the middle of winter, so we used to stash cans of cider in the old cupboards, and they'd basically act like walk-in fridges. It got to the point that we ended up occupying one of the flats, bringing over an old nylon string guitar and other amenities so the place felt a bit more homely. So this one night, just after Christmas, about five of us pile into the old place to get drunk and have a sing-song. I remember that we were halfway through Bowie's Man Who Sold the World when the off-key twang of a string breaking had us all groaning with disappointment. What's more, it was the G-string. Take a moment to get all the broken G-string jokes out of your system. Okay, you done? Good. On with the story. Anyone who knows anything about playing guitar will tell you that break a top or bottom string and it's not the end of the world, but break your G-string and nothing quite sounds the same. So, there we were, basically condemned to a silent disco for the night. But it didn't dampen our spirits entirely, so we committed to staying for a few hours to at least make the most of the evening. We're all just sitting around chatting bollocks and bumming smokes off of each other when... One of us loudly hushes the rest before holding a single finger in the air, as if to say, listen. There's a brief silence, and I do mean silence. No one heard a thing, so the lad who'd shushed everyone just put it down to him hearing things. The mood softens again quickly, and we're back to drinking and just giving each other a hard time. Only a little while later, the same lad does the same hushing thing. He's not alone this time, though. Another one of us swore down that he too had heard something, a scratching or shuffling noise coming from the dark corridor outside the flat. Have one lad with an attack of paranoia, and you can take the energy out of him. Have two lads hear the same bloody thing, and you start to take things a bit more serious. One of us pokes their head out of the flat, shining the light of his phone's screen into the darkness, before turning back to tell us there was nothing there. These flats were half falling down. It was perfectly reasonable to expect them to creak and croak a fair bit. A few of us managed to relax again, but the two guys who'd heard the noises remained anxious, shooting each other nervous looks in between scanning the flat's open doorway for movement. Cut to a few hours later and it's coming up to midnight. Energy levels are dipping severely and so are the noise levels. This meant the atmospherics were perfectly attuned for us to perfectly hear the creaking of floorboard just above our heads. This wasn't just the rundown condition of the building either. It was painfully obvious that the show and deliberate creak came from a football on the floor above us. Don't ask me how we knew that. Sometimes your gut just tells you everything you need to know about a certain sound or shape in the darkness. That's how the human race has survived for so long and so successfully, in my opinion. There really is such a thing as a sixth sense. As soon as we hear that creak, we all freeze. I mean, proper statues still, barely even breathing, with all eyes glued to the ceiling. We start asking each other what that was, but we all knew someone or something was up there, and had been up there the entire time. I should add at this point we managed to compile a little collection of wooden sticks, iron bars, and other such debris that we told ourselves was our weapon stash. It was all just a bit of a joke to be honest. They were of purely totomic value. But in the moments that followed that horrible bloody creak, 
I thanked that which was holy that we'd had the foresight to collect them. Each of us grabbed something to defend ourselves with before falling silent again, listening for any other creaking sounds above us. We weren't left waiting long. Another creak, then another, each one getting closer and closer to where the front entrance to the upstairs flat would be. We couldn't help but sit there, terrified, listening as whatever was up there got closer and closer to us. When the footsteps stopped, one of us plucked up the courage to creep towards the open front door of the flat and stick their head out. The next thing I know, we're just pouring down the stairs of the apartment block, with the lad who'd scouted the stairs shouting out how there's someone up there. We were scared, maybe a little over paranoid, but over the next few days, we started to question if we'd ever seen what we thought we had. I remember seeing the shape of something on the stairs above us, but I wasn't 100% sure it was a man, and neither was anyone else if we were honest with ourselves. In the end, I had convinced myself we'd imagined the whole thing and decided to run a little experiment. I left a loaf of bread in the lobby of the apartment block, intending to prove that there was no one living there when the loaf was still there, growing mold a few days later. But when I got back, it was gone. Years later, we watched the council demolish those flats, as wrecking balls smashed into the brickwork and plastic window frames. We mourned our old hideaway, yes, but mostly, we wondered if whoever was in there would be buried in the rubble. On Friday the 12th of February 1993, a woman by the name of Denise Bolger took her son James to the New Strand Shopping Centre in Bootle, a suburb of Liverpool in the UK. James was two years old at the time, just over a month away from his third birthday. So he was not quite old enough to be attending nursery school and therefore Denise would take James with her wherever she went. At around 3.40pm, whilst inside a small, independent butcher's shop on the lower floor of the center, Denise, who had been temporarily distracted, realized that her son had disappeared. She looked around the immediate area, but it was no good. James was nowhere to be found. Denise then approached the shopping center's security guards and waited as the staff began to wander the shopping center in the hope of finding James. However, on the day in question two local ten-year-old boys were playing truant from school and had decided to visit the New Strand shopping center to partake in a little mischief. Robert Thompson and John Venables often ducked out of school together and the New Strand was a favored hangout of theirs, where they would casually shoplift and generally cause trouble for the security staff. Throughout the day, Thompson and Venables stole various items from businesses located in the New Strand, including sweets, a troll doll, some batteries, and a can of blue paint. But it seems the pair grew bored with shoplifting and had decided to up the ante. It was about then they came across James Bolger, who had wandered away from his mother Denise, who was occupied in the butcher's shop. The innocent two-year-old was exactly the kind of new toy the pair had been looking for, and they began to lead the boy by the hand away from the shopping center and his worried mother. The pair walked the young James to the nearby Leeds Liverpool Canal. It is here that one of the worst crimes in the history of the city began. It is not known if it was Venables or Thompson who decided to act first, but we know that James suffered his first injuries at the canal location when one of the older boys picked up the toddler and dropped him on his head, causing grievous injuries to his face and cranium. The trio then began to walk almost five kilometers across the city of Liverpool, where perhaps some of the most haunting events of the crime took place. Nearly 40 witnesses later reported that they'd seen the two ten-year-olds with their two-year-old prisoner, who was apparently crying his eyes out and did absolutely nothing. Only two people challenged the two boys on why they were leading the injured toddler around, but were seemingly convinced by Venables and Thompson's claims that the boy was their little brother or that they were taking the lost and injured boy to a nearby police station. Given that, at the time, they were just minutes from an actual police station, it would have seemed that their story was genuine. But their claims of caring for the boy's welfare were far from true. 
and it is from here that the real nightmare begins. Eventually, the boys arrived in the village of Walton, and with Walton Lane Police Station across the road facing them, they hesitated and led James up a steep bank to a railway line near the disused Walton and Anfield Railway Station, close to Anfield Cemetery. Here, they began to torture him. One of the boys threw some of the blue modeling paint they previously stolen into young James' left eye. They kicked him, stamping on the boy's fragile body, before throwing bricks and stones at him. Batteries were placed in Bulger's mouth, and according to police, some batteries may have been inserted into his anus. Finally, the boys dropped a heavy iron bar described in court as a railway fish plate onto the young James. He sustained ten skull fractures as a result of the bar striking his head. The case's pathologist later stated that Bulger suffered a total of 42 injuries as a result of the assault, so many that it was impossible for him to determine which one had been the fatal blow. Thompson and Venables then laid the dying child across the railway tracks and weighted his head down with rubble in hopes that a train would hit him and make his death appear to be purely accidental. After they left the scene, his body was cut in half by a train. Bulger's severed body was discovered two days later on Valentine's Day. The same forensic pathologist testified that he had died before he was struck by the train. Police suspected that there was a carnal element to the crime since Bulger's shoes, socks, trousers, and underpants had been removed. The pathologist's report, which was read out in court, found that Bulger's foreskin had been forcibly retracted. When Thompson and Venables were questioned about this aspect of the attack by detectives and a child psychiatrist, Eileen Vizard, the pair were reluctant to give details and also denied inserting some of the batteries into Bulger's anus. At his eventual parole, Venable psychiatrist Susan Bailey reported that, visiting and revisiting the issues with John as a child and now as an adolescent, he gives no count of any carnal element to the offense. The police quickly found low-resolution video images of Bulger's abduction from the New Strand Shopping Center by two unidentified boys. The railway embankment upon which his body had been discovered was adorned with hundreds of bunches of flowers. The family of one boy, who was detained for questioning but subsequently released, had to flee the city due to threats by vigilantes. The breakthrough came when a woman, on seeing slightly enhanced images of the two boys on national television, recognized Venables, who she knew had played truant with Thompson that day. She contacted police and the boys were arrested. The fact that the suspects were so young came as a shock to investigating officers. Early press reports and police statements had referred to James Bolger being seen with two youths, which suggesting the killers were in fact teenagers. This was down to the ages of the boys being difficult to ascertain from the images captured by CCTV, but also because it was frankly unbelievable that such brutal action could be committed by those who were themselves children. Forensic tests confirmed that both boys had the same blue paint on their clothing as found on Bulger's body. Both had blood on their footwear, with the blood on Thompson's shoe being matched to Bulger's through DNA tests. A pattern of bruising on Bulger's right cheek matched the features of the upper part of a shoe worn by Thompson. A paint mark in the toe cap of one of Venable's shoes indicated he must have used some force when he kicked Bulger. In a haunting police interview, Thompson is said to have asked police whether the two-year-old had been taken to the hospital to get him alive again. The boys were each charged with the murder of James Bolger on the 20th of February 1993 and appeared at South Sefton Youth Court just two days later where they were remanded in custody to await trial. In the aftermath of their arrest and throughout the media accounts of their trial, the boys were referred to only as Child A and Child B. Awaiting trial, they were held in the secure units where they would eventually be sentenced to be detained indefinitely. The boys by then, aged 11, were found guilty of Bulger's murder at the Preston Court on the 24th of November 1993, becoming the youngest convicted murderers of the 20th century. The residing judge told Thompson and Venables that they had committed a crime of unparalleled evil and barbatry. In my judgment, your conduct was both cunning 
and very wicked. He sentenced them to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure with a recommendation that they should be kept in custody for very, very many years to come, recommending a minimum term of eight years. At the close of the trial, the judge lifted reporting restrictions and allowed the names of the killers to be released, saying, I did this because the public interest overrode the interests of the defendants. There was a need for an informed public debate on crimes committed by young children. At about 8.15 a.m. on the morning of Wednesday the 13th of March 1996, Thomas Hamilton, a 43-year-old former shopkeeper from Glasgow, was seen scraping ice off his van outside his home at Kent Road in Stirling. He departed shortly afterwards, driving about five miles north to the south town of Dunblane. Hamilton arrived at Dunblane Primary School at around 9.30 that morning and parked his van near a telephone pole in the car park of the school. Hamilton then cut the cables at the bottom of the telephone pole, severing communications to several nearby houses before making his way across the car park towards the school buildings. Hamilton had intended to cut the phone lines to the school itself, but had selected the wrong telegraph pole. He then headed towards the northwest side of the school to a door leading to the toilets in the school gymnasium. After entering, he made his way to the gymnasium. In the gym was a class of 28 7 and 8 year old pupils preparing for a PE lesson, being supervised by three adult members of staff. Before Hamilton entered the gym, the staff heard two loud bangs coming from the hallway outside. Then, after entering the gymnasium, and as he was about to be confronted by Eileen Harold, the PE teacher in charge of the lesson, he started shooting rapidly and randomly, armed with four legally held handguns, two 9mm Browning HP pistols, and two Smith & Wesson M19 357 Magnum revolvers. He was also carrying 743 rounds of ammunition. He shot one of the supervising teachers, who received wounds to their arms and chest as she attempted to protect herself, and continued shooting into the gymnasium. The wounded teacher then stumbled into the open plan store cupboard at the side of the gym along with several injured children. Gwen Mayer, the class's teacher, was shot through the heart and died instantly. The other adult present was shot in the head and both legs, but also managed to make her way to the store cupboard and with several of the children in front of her. In the time it took to reach the gymnasium and take a few steps inside, Hamilton had fired 29 shots with the pistols, killing one child and injuring several others. Four injured children had taken shelter in the store cupboard along with the injured teachers, Harold and Blake. Hamilton then made his way up the east side of the gym, firing as he walked. He then walked towards the center of the gym, firing 16 shots at point-blank range towards a group of terrified children who had been incapacitated by the bullets he had previously fired. An older pupil who was walking along the west side of the gym building at the time heard loud bangs and screams and looked inside the gym. Hamilton shot in his direction and the pupil was injured by flying glass before running away. From this position... Hamilton fired 24 shots in seemingly random directions. He fired shots towards a window next to the fire exit at the southeast end of the gym, possibly at an adult who was walking across the playground, and then fired four more shots in the same direction after opening the fire exit door. Hamilton then exited the gym briefly through the fire exit, firing another four shots towards the cloakroom of the library, striking and injuring Grace Tweddle, another member of the staff of the school. In the mobile classroom closet to the fire exit where Hamilton was standing, Catherine Gordon saw him firing shots and instructed her class to get down onto the floor before Hamilton fired nine bullets into the classroom, striking books and equipment. One bullet passed through a chair where a child had been sitting seconds before. Hamilton then re-entered the gym, dropped the pistol he was using, and took out one of the two revolvers he was packing. He put the barrel of the gun in his mouth, pointed it upwards, and pulled the trigger. A total of 32 people sustained gunshot wounds inflicted by Hamilton over a four-minute period, 16 of whom were fatally wounded in the gymnasium, which included Mayer and 15 of her pupils. 
The first call to the police was made at 9.41 a.m. The call was made by the headmaster of the school, Ronald Taylor, who had been alerted by a colleague of the possibility of a gunman on the school premises. Taylor had also heard screaming inside the gymnasium and had seen what he thought to be cartridges on the ground. Taylor had been aware of loud noises which he assumed to have been from builders on site that he had not been informed of. As he was on his way to the gym, the shooting ended and when he saw what happened, he ran back to his office and told the deputy headmistress to call for ambulances, a second emergency call which was made at 9.43 a.m. The first ambulance arrived on the scene just 14 minutes later. Just another medical team from Dunblane Health Center arrived shortly after, which included doctors and a nurse who were involved in the initial resuscitation of the injured. The accident and emergency department at Sterling Royal Infirmary had also been informed of a major incident involving multiple casualties at 9.48 a.m., and they had dispatched ambulance crews from several nearby areas to help all the wounded. By about 11.10 a.m., all of the injured had been taken to Sterling Royal Infirmary for medical treatment, with one child dying en route to the hospital. Upon examination, several of the patients were transferred to the District Royal Infirmary in Falkirk, and some of the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Glasgow. As it turned out, there had been several complaints to police regarding Hamilton's behavior towards the young boys who attended the youth clubs he was discovered to have ran. Claims had been made of his having taken photographs of semi-nude boys without parental consent. Hamilton had briefly been a scout leader, but as previously stated, complaints were made about his leadership, including two occasions when scouts were forced to sleep with Hamilton in his van during hill-walking expeditions. Within months of his appointment, Hamilton's scout warrant was withdrawn, with the county commissioner stating that he was suspicious of his moral intentions towards boys. He was blacklisted by the association and thwarted in a later attempt he made to become a scout leader in another Scottish constituency. Hamilton claimed in letters that rumors about him led to the failure of his shop business in 1993. In the last months of his life, he complained again that his attempts to organize a boys club were subjugated to persecution by local police and the scout movement. Among those he complained to were a local member of parliament, but also shockingly enough to Queen Elizabeth. In the 1980s, another MP who lived in Dunblane had complained about Hamilton's local boys' club, which his son had attended. On the day following the massacre, Robertson spoke of having previously argued with Hamilton in his own home. No doubt he felt he'd had a lucky escape with a deranged and violent psychopath. On the 19th of March, 1996, a mere six days after the brutal, horrifying massacre, Hamilton's body was cremated. According to police spokesmen, the service was conducted far away from Dunblane. Hey friends, thanks for reading. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, political correctness... It's just fascism pretending to be manners.